live from the Facebook place. Thank you very much for being here tonight and watch our lecture. So tonight our lecture is going to be about destruction and preservation and therefore I would like to call Mani to do this for us. Mani, please. Good evening, everybody. Good so evening. Welcome to Allan Kardec's Prince of Group of New Zealand. One more lecture on the Facebook place. <laughs> we're going to be live. Um, so once again, like I said, said, thanks everybody for coming here. Um, it's, uh, it's a very um, uh, promising week and time of the year. As we know, spring is coming, so we're starting to feel a bit warmer. Even um, if it's not spring in other parts of the world, in New Zealand, we're the first one to receive the sun, but also the first one to receive the seasons. So we are already in spring, if you're not in New Zealand. Um, yeah, and also when we come to talk to spring, we also think about regeneration, we also think about you know, new life and growth. Um, and the topic for tonight is very, can, not it is, but it can be very controversial, can be quite polemical, especially if we're thinking about you know, the, the current affairs that we can see everywhere. You know, Amazon is burning, the, there's a fire in the South Island, it's in the Southern Alps, you know, there's... Um, uh, Dorian, uh, Dorian hurricane narrowly passing through Florida. So we can see destructions happening all around us. And sometimes can be quite controversial, sometimes can be quite um, not confusing, but we can be puzzled us. You know, why so much destruction around us? So just to, uh, in advance, I'd like to let you know that this, I won't be touching anything political or social. So no, it's just just about what Spiritism is going to be telling us about these two concepts. They are contrasting destruction. We have to get destruction and preservation. They are you know, they are contrasting you know, destruction, but also preservation. But if we analyze life itself, we can see they actually complement each other and they are without one, there is not possible to have the other. And so we're going to be analyzing that in this, in this um, using the Spiritist book, the Spirit book, also the Genesis and Transição Planetaria, Planetary Transition by Manuel Fenomeno de Miranda and Divaldo Franco. Um, to understand this, this complexity of this thing. So, um, yes, we're going to do just a little outline of tonight's uh, lecture. We're going to be talking about the moral and divine laws. Just an overview, because these two topics are part of the divine laws. But what are the divine laws? What are the natural laws? We're just going to have a little bit of overview on that. And then we're going to talk about the necessary destruction, three examples of the micro world, the macro world or the, or the cosmos, the food chain. We're also going to see the relation between the natural destruction and preservation. We're going to study a little bit about excessive and abusive destruction, the catastrophe and disaster that happen. And then towards the end, we're going to touch on the planetary transition and the new generation and final thoughts as well. So just going over the moral laws and the divine laws, uh, coming from a spiritist point of view, we must remember that the most important preset of our doctrine, of our study, is that, in fact, the first question of the Spirit's book is, what is God? This reminder that it's not who is God, but what is God? God is not a person, so it's not who, what is God? And the answer is, God is the primary uh, cause of all things, primary intelligence of all things, and He's the creator of all things, and also gives us many um, attributes of God. We're going to be focusing on is sovereignly just and good. So everything else the Spiritism teaches is based upon that. God is the creator of all things. Us, the nature, the universe, the micro world, the macro world, and everything that is, is alive. Um, and not only materially, but also spiritually. And he's also sovereignly good and just. There's nothing that is good as just as, as our creator, as God. So this goes to, as, as, a, as a 
beginning of all everything that we're going to be studying in Spiritism. Um, and the way we, we can try to understand God because of our lack of, of understanding of spiritual and intellectual evolution, we need to understand God by His, His work, His creation, and by His divine laws, which are the, the same as the natural laws. So on the chapter 3, not chapter 3, on the third part of the Spirit's book is all designed to introduce us to the moral laws. The first chapter of that part of the Spirit's book is called the divine law or the natural law, saying that everything is created by God in the material world, but also the physical world. Science has the purpose of studying the natural world, which is designed by, by God, by the natural laws. And Spiritism, is, the purpose is to study the moral laws, the ethic and the moral life that we should understand ourselves, but also the relationship that we have with one another as children of God, and also the relationship that we have between all of us and God Himself. So these are laws that must be observed in order to better understand God, because God as, as a concept of Creator is something that it's is too very abstract for our very small minds you know for us like we like like in a movie we like to see the beginning the middle and the end but to try to understand something that has no beginning because as we know another attribute of god is god is is eternal it ever was and it will ever be we cannot comprehend that so we need to break it down into little chapters of this story of life in, in order to understand the bigger concept of God. And we have been doing that through civilization, through the many different revelations of God, through Moses, through Jesus, and our spiritism giving us a new paradigm to understand, uh, to try to understand a little bit of God. So they divided these, mor these moral laws, the divine laws, into ten. The first one is the law of worship, understanding that we have an uh, uh, innate feeling that there is something bigger than us that first developed itself as fear from early civilizations that feared the nature, feared the elements of the nature, and this decided that they were gods. And then uh, the same, uh, when Moses came down, came to give the revelation, we believed that it was a god that was very revengeful, a god that took sides, that he take my side against the other side. Jesus came to bring us a more loving god, but all of this is part of the law of worship. We have this feeling that is natural to us because all these laws, they've been placed into our conscience as beings that were created simple and ignorant, God put a little seed in our conscience. And part of this conscience is this feeling of having something greater than us, which is His nature, the nature of God. There's a second law which talks about the law of labor. Everything in nature, everything that was created by God, needs to work. We all have a purpose. From a little ant has a purpose to us, we have a purpose for planets orbiting around the billions of suns around the world. Mm -hmm. Everything works. Everything has a purpose. To this law of, of course, I'm just brushing over all these because we're trying to get to the topic of the evening. Um, and then that was chapter three. Um, chapter four. That's when we talk about the law of um, reproduction. Chapter 5 and chapter 6 are preservation and destruction. So these are very important laws for us to understand in order to understand the divine laws and our connection between ourselves um, and between ourselves and also God. So it is a very important topic according to Spiritism so we can understand our lives, our physical lives as well as the spiritual lives, much better. Um, and it's a great way to, to, to study as well. It's all in the, in the third part of the Spirit's book. And some of it is also in the Genesis. Um, so, it's something that we, we're talking about God being just and good. If God is just and good, why is there so much destruction in this planet, in this life? Because like I was talking about, we, we, we watching the, the movie of, of, of life, direct, directed by God, <laughs> we only see a few chapters because we, see, we tend to th see things with our material world, with our material understanding. 
we cannot see, uh, we cannot understand the occurrences of daily life from their true origin. We forget that we don't belong to this to this stage here. We are just incarnated at this moment, going through these earthly experiences. But we are not born spiritually when we are born physically. We come from a previous past, which we don't remember. But we are here with a baggage. We are here as part of, of a bigger plane. So when we see something that is destructive, we have this feeling that it's really bad, right? Who here thinks that destruction has a connotation of bad things? Yeah. Most people, right? It has a bad connotation. Destruction means that you know it, it, it's something that is bad. Because we have this idea, we don't understand um, the concept of destruction. But I'm going to show you very soon how destruction it is actually very important. And it happens every second. But first, let's have a look, see what the Spirit tells us. Um, um, on question 7 to 728, um, Allah Kardec asks the spirits, is destruction a law of nature? And then the, spirits, the superior spirits reply, it is necessary for everything to be destroyed in order to be reborn and regenerated. What you call destruction is no more than transformation that is aimed at renewing and improving living beings. So now we can see a paradigm. What we call destruction is nothing but transformation. Let's talk a little bit about um, something that we tend, don't like to talk about, the real estate market in New Zealand, especially Auckland. Okay, people buying a, a bungalow or a little villa somewhere, and what do they do to make it better? They have to destroy it, to make, to make a bigger house, a better, a better house. So destruction is necessary there. I'm using a very physical example, but the same things happen for us as well. Everything, to be, need, everything needs to be destroyed in order to be reborn and regenerated. So our concept of destruction, we could easily replace by transformation. That already loses the bad connotation that we carry in us. Yeah? We carry a lot of, of guilt, a lot of things that our baggage brings to us that our destruction, oh, this is really bad, something bad is about to happen. But it's not necessarily bad, it's a transformation, okay? But not all, not all transformations, not all destructions are equal. <laughs> There's different types of destruction. There are two forms of destruction on the planet. One is beneficial, the other is abusive. The first is nothing but a transformation that aims at the renovation and improvement of beings. The other type, the abusive destruction, is not foreseen in the law of God. And it is a result of intellectual and moral imperfection of man. So not all destruction is, is positive. There are some destructions that, that is abusive. And this type of destruction does not come from God. It comes from the imperfection of man or ourselves. Yeah. So, if we, especially if we're looking from a spiritual perspective, we see that um, as we are here, to be reincarnated here, we had died before. We had a different body. We, our previous body had to be destructed, decomposed, so we can return to the spiritual world and incarnate again. So we've been through destruction many, 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 many times. <laughs> Yeah, but because we don't see that, we just see it as now, we tend to think that um, that is a bad thing. But I'm going to show in a few slides that it happens even with us, with uh, us noticing or knowing destruction. Disclaimer, I'm not a microbiologist, I'm not an astrophysicist, okay? We're going to be talking about these things. So if there's any of, of these careers here, you can call me out, or in the internet, people want to call me out, that's fine. I don't pretend to be any of that. I just want to show you some very basic concepts of destruction that happens every day, and we don't, um, we take for granted, we don't even know. So the micro world, apoptosis and autophagy. I'm not swearing, okay, these are very <laughs> complicated words, but I'm going to explain what happens. Um, if we look at ourselves, we are ourselves physically, because as we know, we are not our bodies. Okay, we are spiritual beings that are using this as 
a cloak, as a uniform, to be on this school we call Earth. This is not us. This is not me. My body is not me. I am a soul that is using a body. So in our body that we have, we have destruction happening every second through ap apoptosis and autophagy. Every day, approximately between 50 and 70 billion cells die each day due to ap uh, apoptosis in the average human adult. This phenomenon is called apoptosis. It's, it, its excess causes atrophy, so if too many cells die, it can be atrophied. Whereas an ins insufficient amount results in uncontrolled cell prol proliferation, such as cancer. So if your cells don't die enough, you get sick. So your cells must destruct. It happens every day. And in fact, and in fact, our cells regenerate themselves between seven and ten years. There's no one single cell in my whole body that is exactly the same as the, my body was seven, ten years ago. It's gone. Just, just to reinforce that we are not our bodies. We are not our bodies. We are a soul that is using your body. Okay? So don't be afraid of destruction. It happens. It's happening right now. Don't freak out. Okay? It's natural. It's okay. And for this a little, I'll put this on the internet as well if you guys want to have a look, you know. And, and um, so cells damage stress or triggered by body signals begin apoptosis. The cell begins to shrink and for blebs, proteins are activated to break down the cellular components. Enzymes break down the nucleus and the cell emits signals to attract macrophages. Macrophages are organisms that are gonna eat the, the, the whatever is left of the dead cell. So it's recycling, our body naturally recycles. The cell breaks into several smaller pieces containing the cell components and destroys nucleus. Macrophages recognize the cell parts and remove them from the body. Okay, this is genius, right? This is all developed from one single cell on planet Earth that became our bodies. Okay? And once we go, for every, every uh, intelligent effect, there must be an intelligent cause. Once again, God is sovereignly good and um, just, but also very intelligent. Right? <laughs> but this is for the destruction. We're going to be talking about pre pre uh, preservation as well. Some, something else happens. If our body goes into starvation, that's the second part, autophagy. If our body goes into starvation and we don't have enough nutrients, autophagy happens. Our body recognizes that we need nutrients and the cells that are weaker and older, they get eaten by the better cells so they can be stronger. Helping us in our immune systems. Auto, self, phagy, eat, self-eating. We have carnivore. This is part of the preservation. If we are starving, our body starts to eat itself it's in a cellular level. Don't freak out. I can see some weird faces. But this is just to show once again that God knows exactly what we need in our body to, to preserve ourselves. So this is the other part. Process of autophagy. Everything that, that happens, we don't think about it. It just happens naturally. Yet, it is a destructive process in our body. And it's natural until we, our cell reproduction doesn't happen anymore and our physical body dies. But guess what? Our soul moves on. <laughs> you know, just the physical dies. Yeah? So destruction is, is, we're talking about destruction, we're talking about destruction in the material world. Okay? Because the spiritual world is pre-existing and, and also surviving of the physical world. So... Yeah, and all this, uh, all this is taken from many different websites, but mainly from Stanford University, so it's credible sources that we're using here to understand a bit of destruction in the micro world. So now let's go to the other extreme, let's go to the macro world. This not the disclaimer once again, I'm not an astrophysicist, even though I love uh, you know, astro uh, astronomy. And um, we can see that in typical galaxies like the Milky Way, our own galaxy, a massive star, we're talking about 10 times, 100 times bigger than the, the sun, our sun, ends its life in a supernova about every 100 years. Less massive stars, like the sun, which to us is the biggest star, the closest star, 
um, end their lives as planetary nebula, leading to the formation of white dwarfs. So even planets die. We're talking about cells dying, but also planets die. Um, there are about one of these per year. So every year, one star like the sun dies in our galaxy, in average, creating white dwarfs, creating new lives. Okay? Um, and one star dying each year as planetary nebula in the Milky Way. So, some of the pretty pictures that we can admire. So, as we can see, death also happens in the macro world, in the cosmos. We don't really stop to think about it because, you know, we're not, we're not astrophysicists, but it's something that happens, you know. And they estimate that about 100 billion, the number of galaxies in the observers universe. So there's a hundred billion galaxies. We're talking about the Milky Way, one. Okay, so there are about 100 billion stars being born and dying each year, which correspond to about 275 million per day in the whole observable universe. So there's 275 million stars dying every day in the universe, in the observable universe. Okay, so death, it's out there as well. Okay, not death, but Destruction, I should say, because as we saw, it's not destruction, it's transformation, okay? So it happens. We're going to be talking something that it might be even more controversial than the fires in the Amazon. We're going to talk about the food chain. <laughs> yeah, is it another pro this, the, uh, destructive or transformational process of energy or resources, okay? As we know, a food chain is a linear sequence of links in a food web starting from a species that are called producers in the web and ends at the species that are called consumers slash decomposers species in the web. So it's the way that as mammals, as human beings, as part of a mam mammal, as part of the animal kingdom, we need to eat to get energy from different sources. Okay? But this energy comes from down to the food chain and for example we have a it's not a very good example here because it has snake we're not snakes in New Zealand <laughs> but let's go with that one <laughs> so we have the, the, in this example the flower is a producer we have the caterpillar that is gonna eat the flower they extract this material energy from the flower and then the frogs will come frogs will come and eat the caterpillar and then a snake in Australia will come and eat the frogs <laughs> All right, and then an owl or an eagle or another another um, consumer will eat the snake. So the, the energy that primarily came from the sun will be end up in the top of the chain, and we can see many other different examples of the food chain. So you can see that the species depend on the destruction of another species. In in our case, because we're at the top of that food chain. The destruction of many species. Too many species, if we ask for the number of people in this earth. Okay? But this is a process of destruction, but we're going to start to look now at the correlation between destruction and preservation. Because preservation is also part of the law of God, the divine laws. We need to preserve our bodies. In order for our spirits to evolve, we need to have nourished bodies. Our body, like I mentioned before, is like our uniform, but it can be our car, it can be our, uh, our tool, it can be our instrument, it can be our, what we use to evolve. We need our body because we are incarnated on this planet, so we need our bodies. Our body to be functioning well. To function well, we need to preserve it. To preserve it, we need, at the stage that we are, we need to, to destroy. Or, in other words, we need to transform that energy that is suitable to us. So this is part, also part of the law of preservation. Then not just to us, you know, the frog needs to skin, the frog seeing the snake coming around, the frog needs to leap <laughs> high and, and wide and then go on the, the lake or go somewhere far to escape. It's part of our instinct. We must survive. Just like I was talking about before, if you go into starvation, our body starts to is in, physically try to get energy from itself, you know, as, as beings of creation, we need to preserve ourselves. Because um, there is a phrase by the father of modern chemistry, 
Nothing is lost in nature, nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed. For many years I thought there was McDonald's slowly. They don't lose anything, they put everything in the burger. And nothing was in the rubbish. I'm not paying, I'm not getting paid by McDonald's or any other food chain, don't worry. Uh, there was just a failed joke. Nothing is lost, nothing is created, everything is transformed. And this is, we're talking about more than chemistry, we're talking about 17, uh, 1794, that when everybody died, okay? So, everything is transformed in this life. So, and when we're talking about the food chain, a lot of thoughts come to my mind, our mind, especially when we talk about the destruction of other beings, you know? How can God be just and good if he permits or allows, allows this to happen in nature? Why do we need to, in order to preserve ourselves, we need to go and destroy, destroy or kill other beings? Why isn't there another way? Because we, like I said before, we tend to see with our, with our material eyes. We tend to see this as a, just a temporary. Um, uh, we, see, we tend to see this temporary life as the only life that we have. We have to understand that everything that happens in this life has a continuation. Not only for us, but for any form of life. Everything is in a process of progress, which is another, another law of nature. Everything in life progresses. It's part of the law. So any form of life, any form of intelligent principle will evolve. So the destruction of, of, the, of the animals, destruction of plants, our destruction is part of a, big, a bigger transformational path. Does that mean that we have to lack sympathy or, or um, for the animals, for the how, how we treat animals these days? No. Does that ex exclude anything that we should be, just don't care about our bodies because, okay, I want to reincarnate again in my body, I have a new body anyway, so who cares about this body? No. Because by doing that, we are going against a divine law. We're going against our own spiritual nature. Like I mentioned before, when we were created, we were given these little seeds of conscience. I mean, seeds in our conscience, the divine laws. That we are, as, as we evolve, we are better understanding it and better um, able to apply in our lives as we evolve. But with the, the news, breaking news is we're not going to evolve in just one life. So every life, we start to learn a little bit more, we start to evolve a bit more, we, try to we start to understand a bit more these divine laws, and therefore, understanding God. We'll take all our spiritual life, but we have this in our hand as well. So, it is something that we can think, that can, it can bring to our mind that something that is not just, it's not fair for the animals, it's not fair for the destruction that we created. As long as this, this destruction is natural, it is not abusive, it is according to the law, of God, because we have to preserve ourselves as individuals, as societies, and as human beings. So let's have a look a little bit. We talk a little bit about the law of destruction. Now let's see what the spirits tell us about the, the law of preservation. On question 702, Alan Kardec has the spirits in the spirits book. Is the self-preservation instinct a law of nature? Absolutely. All living beings possess it, regardless of the degree of intelligence. In some, it is purely mechanical, in others, it is thought out. So, it's not just in us. Every living being has this instinct of preservation. It wants to live. It needs to live. It's something that is innate in us, this um, instinct of self-preservation. Um, so what was God's purpose in granting the instinct of self-preservation to all living beings? Alan Kardec asked. And then the spirits tell us that all beings must collaborate in the designs of providence. That, that is why God has given them the need to stay alive. Besides, life is necessary for beings to perfect themselves. So everything that is alive is part of God's design. And I keep thinking, well, even the flies. 
<laughs> or even the cockroaches. <laughs> yes, they are part of God's design. They have a purpose. Because uh, as we talked about, God is the, the ultimate intelligence. If there wasn't, there wouldn't be flies. There wouldn't be mosquitoes. There wouldn't be snakes. Everything has a purpose. Everything is collaborating in the design of the providence. It says it. And that's why God gives it the need to stay alive. And besides, life is necessary for beings to perfect themselves. So, it doesn't, it doesn't say humans to perfect themselves. Beings to perfect themselves. Because everything in creation is perfecting itself. It's part of the law of progress, once again. Um, and then we keep asking, you know, because that's, that's a lot of, that's why I say this could, could be controversial because, you know, there's a big talk about how um, vegetarians, vegans, you know, why we people still destroy animals to eat, you know, they, actually Kardec asked this question back 100, 100, over 160 years ago about use of animals as food, 723, is humankind's use, sorry, it's missing a positive there, physical constitution, flesh nourishes flesh, otherwise humans would perish. The law of self-preservation imposes on you the duty to preserve your energies and health so that you may fulfill the law of labor. You should therefore eat according to the requirements of your own physical organization. Okay? It's a very broad answer, okay? It doesn't say yes or no. But what we can take from that, what I can take from that is that with your present physical constitution, flesh nourishes flesh. That was written 160 years ago. You know, so we can all see how, how much we have evolved physically, ethically, and morally to, to justify our need for, for flesh. Some people have decided that they don't need it, and some people have decided that they can go without it, and that's great. That shows that in their um, in their consciousness, in their conscience, they are, they are, they don't need to kill animals to, to live. But there are others, including myself, because I eat meat. I tried going without eating meat for a while. My doctor said, "What's wrong? You are, your heart is low. You cannot donate blood anymore." So I do, I do eat meat, but in a in a less obsessive way. Mm -hmm. Do we really need as much meat as we needed 160 years ago? where people used to walk everywhere, horse riding everywhere. You know, do we need to eat as much as we do these days? Do we need all that sugar? Do we need all those soft drinks that we drink? Do we actually need that? Or is that a fake, superfluous need that we created in ourselves because of society? So we have to question that. By having a deregulated um, diet, am I preserving myself or am I destructing myself? Am I creating an apoptosis <laughs> earlier than the, this should be should happen? Okay, so just, uh, just uh, some, some, something for us to think about. Okay, so um, yeah, and on top, on top of that as well, um, not only what, how we eat animals, but also how we treat the animals. As you know, it's a big industry. It's a big industry that sometimes produces more than we need. Because if we start to think about it, we have three, uh, seven billion uh, people in this planet. And according to Emmanuel in, in the book Roteiro, you know, this, there's about other 20, or this book was written in the 50s, so maybe more, 20 billion spirits in the psychosphere of Earth waiting to reincarnate. And if we manage our resources well, we could feed, we could feed all these spirits. We could feed way more than we feed these days, but in, in, we can see a planet that there, there is, in the moment, still people dying of hunger and people dying of obesity. So, <laughs> this happens because we are uh, still very um, behind our moral ethics and our moral, the way we deal with our lives. That's when we're going to have a look at the destructive calamities. Why the, the destructive um, calamities and also these um, abusive destruction happens you know, in, in, our, in our society. So destructive calamities, 
Um, yeah, so we already talked about the first one, Fernanda Calamit is the actual. Um, but let's read it again. There are two types of destructive calamities, the natural and those caused by man. We're talking about floods and, and um, um, earthquakes and, and all, those, all that kind of uh, stuff. In the first line of calamities, natural and independent of human actions, we find plagues, famine, floods, deadly storms to the productions due to the productions of the earth. So these are natural, they are happening, and they've been prophesized before, as we're gonna be, we're gonna see later. But there's also a second one that are, these are caused by us, caused by the imbalance that we create in our planet, caused by the imbalance that we create in our uh, society. The destructive calamities caused by humans reveal the predominance of the animal nature over the spiritual nature. And these desires of satisfying, satisfying material passions in the barbaric states, the various people, peoples, know no other right than that of the strongest. The strongest will survive, the stronger will punish the, the weaker. And the normal condition is therefore that of war. There has never been a, a time of peace on earth, complete. There's always been wars everywhere. As we speak, there are wars happening as well. As mankind progresses, war becomes less frequent through their avoidance of the causes which, uh, which led to it, and when it becomes inevitable, they wage it more humanely. Mm -hmm. They even did wars these days, it don't happen as like they, they happened in the First World War, for example, when everything was very brutal. And, and um, So as we can see, as we evolve as human beings, wars won't be as necessary, which is a calamity caused by humans, caused by greed, caused by control of power as well. Um, but these are not new, we're talking about wars, like I said before, there's never been a time of 100% peace on this planet. We have to once again remind ourselves that planet Earth is only on the second stage of evolutionary um, um, planetary uh, stage. We used to be primitive, now we are under trials and atonements where most spirits are here are um, either purifying themselves or going on missions or paying for uh, wrongdoings from the past, and we are going through a, a transformational stage. But these um, occurrences, they have been prophetized in the Bible, and by Jesus, as in Matthew 24, item 6 to 8. Jesus said that you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Don't worry. That's what Jesus was saying. You hear of wars, you hear of rumors of wars, but do not be alarmed. Such things must happen. But the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. That was over 2,000 years ago. That was prophesied. All these are the beginning of birth pains. So from that, there are many things that are shocking and, you know, because we see they're happening. We see they're happening right now. So Jesus was right. Um, but two things kind of jump on me. Do not be alarmed. This is happening. This is part of the plan. This is part of the script. It's like, um, it's like we go to a movie, like I'm talking about movie before, movie of life directed by God. And we go to the movie theater with our script. We want the movie to be like our script. But what's on the screen is not our script. We freak out. We think, oh no, this is not happening. No, because we are alarmed because it's not part of what we, what we think is good. What we think is right. But you have to remember that the director of the movie of life is God. And he's the best. He's got all the Oscars in his middle. <laughs> okay? So, do not be alarmed. This is, this is, this is, such things must happen. But then it tells about something else in the eight, item eight. All these are the beginning of birth pains. So something, for something to be regenerated, something to be born, there's pain involved. <laughs> I mean, I'm a man, I can't tell much, but I know for all the movements that her mother is here, 
There is a lot of pain involved in birth, right? So it's it is part of the plan. It's part of a, of a birth of what? Birth of a new period, a new regenerative stage that we're going through. So once again, if we try to think, try to discuss God's justice, for what purpose does God inflict humankind with destructive calamities? Why? To impel them to progress more quickly. So like we have to progress, but we like, oh. and then uh, the earthquake is coming or the uh, tsunami is coming, we have to run, right? Haven't we stated that destruction is necessary for the moral regeneration of spirits? Because, of course, we're not, I mean, I'll just make a silly joke here, but once the destructive part of it as well, is, is, there's a lot of pain involved. There's a lot of people that, and should we not feel for that? No, we should, because we, are, we all know there are other people and other spirits that are suffering. But this life is temporary in the different realm, a different our reality, Things will be th things will continue. So, for the moral regeneration of spirits who accomplish a new degree of perfect perfection during each new existence. However, these hardships are often needed in order to make things arrive at a better order more quickly, and to accomplish in a few years what would otherwise require centuries. Because sometimes after the destruction of a city. Or, or, you know, or, um, you know, things regrow. We had a, a very recent, I mean, nine years ago, the earthquake in Christchurch it was destroyed. People died. You know, but the city is regenerating, is rebuilding. They are building a city in a way that if something like that were to happen, they wouldn't go through the same thing. It was a learning curve, a very painful one. But it is, if you're talking about the future, if you're talking about not only the future life as in spiritual life, but the future of the city is, is an improvement. So, and we can see that this will happen, like, like, like Jesus said through Matthew, this will happen. And we, sh we, should, uh, we shouldn't ignore what happens. We should pray for those who, that, who are in need, we should help those who are in need because of these calamities, but we shouldn't be alarmed. Because God is in the, in the, in the director's seat. Mm -hmm. We don't know the whole reality of this behind the, the material life. So, in this other book called Planetary Transition by Manuel Fernandes Miranda, it explains about, you guys remember the Boxing Day mm -hmm. tsunami in uh, Indonesia, in the Indian Ocean, 2004? Mm -hmm. Thousands of people died. To suffer with this tsunami, and in this book, um, the first part of the book, they they describe the many spirits helping the the people that that disincarnated on that, you know, that have been received in the spiritual world, you know, and explaining in the uh, other chapters that this it will happen more frequently because it is part of the progress. It will happen. Why? Because we need to progress more quickly. Not to be alarmed. I see some people are afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't be alarmed. It's all part of the plan. We just have to live and do the best as we can. To evolve ourselves as we have time. Um, as we can see, um, so this, this evolution that is happening is happening to the whole planet. The planet needs to go from one stage to another. And everybody that is here needs to follow this, uh, this evolution. Because those who, are, who don't must be um, transferred to a different school, to a different planet. And we can see this in the Genesis, in chapter um, 18, in the last part of the book, which talks about the new generation. In order that man shall be happy upon the earth, it is necessary to add that it be people with good people with good spirits, incarnate or discarnate, who desire only good. This time has arrived. That was 160 years ago. This time of this change has arrived. Not now. 
A lot of people think, oh, data limici, Chip Xavier, and 2012. It's, it happened 160 years ago, started already. Right? This time has arrived. A great immigration is being accomplished at this moment among those who inhabit it. Those who return evil for evil and in whom the desire to do right is not felt, being unworthy of the transformed state of the earth, will be banished from it because they will be bringing only trouble and confusion and would be an obstacle to progress. The future of the planet is a future of a regenerative planet, which would be good and evil parallel. At the moment, we're having more evil than good in this planet, and we can see, we just have to open our, our Facebook feed and our Instagram or our news, even though there are, there's so much more good that is unseen and unheard and unsung, there's a lot of good happening, but it doesn't bring clicks on the internet, it doesn't bring um, you know, viewers on the media, but there's a lot of good happening. Okay? But there will be a time where the good and evil will be, will be more good than evil in this planet. What would happen to those who don't follow? Because they say they'll be banished from it. They will be replaced by better spirits who will make justice, peace, and fraternity rule among them. As we speak, spirits from a different um, level of planetary evolution are being reincarnated. And we can see that in our kids. That are, some of them are way more intelligent, way more ethical than us, because they bring in them that seed of the divine law is sprouting. As in some of us, it still needs a bit more fertilizer, <laughs> yeah, needs a bit more of, of, uh, of the darkness that we have to go through to dig in our seed to make it sprout. So this is already happening. And then uh, the spirits come to tell us that the present epoch is a transition one. The elements of the two generations are mingling together, placed at the intermediary point. We assist, we watch, at the departure of one and the arrival of the other. That's why it's a planetary, a planetary transition. We are transitioning between stages. And destruction is part of this process. But as remember that the first part we talked about is not destruction. We have to open our eyes to the spiritist view that tells us that this is temporary. So it's not a destruction, it's a transformation. So just some final thoughts. I know we are running. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. Just some final thoughts. Destruction is part of the law of progress. Without destruction, we cannot progress. In our bodies, you know, our cells are dying now. The hair is falling. <laughs> our skin is. That's, part, that's okay, it's, it's happening. Looking from a spiritual, or spiritist, I should say, spiritist point of view, it is only a transformation because the real life is on the spiritual realm. Okay. Abuse and destruction occurs because we still find the predominance of the animal nature over the spiritual nature in the desire of satisfying material passions. We focus on the material, we focus on the body that is always changing, like I said before, we, know we are not our bodies, we are using our bodies as instruments. We are not our bodies, we are souls, we have to uh, shift this mentality that, you know, that we are human beings having spiritual you know, um, occurrences or spiritual experiences, the opposite, we are spirits or souls that are having a human experience at this moment. We have to change this paradigm. Once we start to think like that on a daily basis, in bringing that to our daily life, I think we'll suffer a little bit less when we see destruction or what we think is injustice. And then I'll leave you with another passage from um, Final Thoughts from the Genesis. The most numerous evils are those that humans create through by vices. Those arising from pride, selfishness, ambition, greed, excesses at all costs. Hence, the cause of wars and calamities is entailed the dissensions, the injustices, the oppression of the weak by the strong, the majority, after all, of the diseases. God established laws full of wisdom, which are only for the good of humans. All that is necessary to humans' welfare is the obedience to them. Their way is traced out for them by their conscience. The divine law is engraved upon their hearts.
our way is traced out of, for us by our conscience. Because every day we go to sleep, we, if we do something wrong, you know, we don't we don't have a clear conscience. It's, that pillow is really heavy, isn't it? <laughs> when you do something, we know that you do something wrong. We are in your conscience, you know. And these moral laws, including destruction and preservation, are in us. And as we go through these experiences in our lives, we start to see them in a better way. By suffering, by destruction, by observing other people that go through destruction. We are watchers. We are not only li we are living we are li through us, but we are also watching what goes around us. So it's it's um you know it's quite easy to, to get mad you know and start pointing the fingers and saying you know, this person is to blame or that government is to blame or you know but actually what are we doing in our daily lives to help the preservation of the planet? How much water do we waste when we have a shower? How much lies do we keep on in our house with that are not, in a room that's not being used? How much do we recycle? How much food that we buy that is local food instead of coming from elsewhere? How much do we do in our daily lives to help the planet? There's nothing we can do about the Amazon. We can't go there and, and, and you know. But what do we do in our daily lives? The little steps that help us preserve and conserve our planet. <coughs> Because we all we think, oh, you know, if I if I, if I waste water, it doesn't matter because I'm just one person. But if we all think like that, then what's going to happen? What are we doing to to yeah to make better to be better spirits to help the evolution of the planet? Because sometimes by blaming others, we feel oh yeah, I, I, you don't feel as guilty because you're already blaming somebody else. You know, all these governments, all these people, all these you know whatever. But what actually are you doing in your daily lives? Mm. We all go through these struggles and we forget because we are too busy trying to acquire material things, but we don't take the time to stop to think, what, what can I do to help the planet, our school, our hospital? This is what the planet is. So that goes a little message and a little thank you for everybody for paying attention. And I know some people are afraid, some people are falling asleep, but it's okay. Or comments? Yeah, maybe just a quick one. Uh, I think it's interesting because, um, as you said, we have this point of view of looking at destruction and see that something bad, when actually it's something necessary to have right so in order to to have renovation we need to do to to have destruction and as you said it happens in our body happens on the planet on a micro micro any any kind of world and work <laughs> <laughs> and to build something you need to destroy something. destroy yeah. and even and even uh, the, the the small knowledge that i have even our Peri spirit, you know, it's even that it's growing, it's developing, you know, by time by time, um, and also we as the spirits are also developing, you know, and yes, as we know, sometimes we learn with love, which is good, but we also learn with the pain, you know, and the pain comes for to bring this renovation. You know, for us, because sometimes we're not alert, as you said, what we are doing around us to make everything better. And if you're not doing anything, you know, maybe the pain will come along and bring us this, this call. In, make us quicker. Yeah, make <laughs> us run. And even the war, as you were, will explain, is also part of uh, sometimes a necessity. So if you we can learn with war in a way that something not to be repeated and what what is also caused the, the war you know and not repeat that too and yeah and i've really really you know brought us this new perspective you know and not think as destruction as destruction transformation yeah 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think that part of that reminder that we all have the divine laws in our hearts is very important for us. And, um, but it's very important as well to study the law. So what Mani did today, putting together this really well-structured research with all the spiritism uh, information, because we do have in our hearts, but we have to study to understand and then to apply. Because if we only have um, in our hearts, but we don't understand that, it's really hard to apply. So yeah. thank you so much. No, thank you for bringing that because when I was talking about the micro world and the macro world, like I said, I'm not, you know, I don't pretend to be any deep scientist that understand all that, but I believe that against the typical, you know, axiom or the, the saying that everybody uses, you know, ignorance is bliss, it's quite the opposite. Knowledge is power, yeah? Because the, the moment that you know, you study and you know something, you can use that knowledge for better yourself. The idea that, oh, better not to know things, ignorance is bliss. You know, it's, it's totally the opposite. The more you know, you know, I, I bet nobody here, actually, we know that our, our cells die, right? It's, it's, we don't actually, but we don't stop to think about it, do we? You know, we're not here, there, on the, on driving our car, oh my gosh, my cells are dying. You know, we don't think about it, but it's actually happening. But it's good to bring us to our attention. So we know that it's, it is happening, it's okay, it's part of the, it's part of the divine law. So, to study, like I said, is very important, so you can better understand, you know, what's what's behind it and what's beneath it. Because if not, we just our mind is just wandering, you know. And then by what could take, you know, uh, years to learn, we're gonna take reincarnations to learn just by watching what's around us. It actually instead of studying it, so it is important that we we study it um, because by studying them, we can better understand ourselves. We can better understand the connection that we have with one another and as brothers and sisters, and the connection that we have between us and our Creator God. So. Yeah, and for our evolution, we need both wings the moral and the intellectual. intellectual yeah. Do I have time for one? Yes, one sure. Yeah. I just want to thank you very much for the very well structured lecture. It was amazing. Mm -hmm. And thanks for bringing the cells. It reminds me of epigeneticist Dr. Bruce Lipton. <laughs> He's proven reincarnation through cells. So if who has interest, he's actually through the cells and through studying the cells, he's actually proving reincarnation. Bruce Lipton. Through, through, science. through science. science. Through science. Through the cells. Mm -hmm. Through cool. studying the cells. Yeah, it's, it's just amazing. And yeah, what the ep epigenetics. Epigenetics. Epigenetics, yeah. It's a, study, it's a new epigenetics. study of science studying yeah, the genes and beyond the genes. And mm -hmm. you are not a victim of your genes. <laughs> it's amazing, and he's actually proving through studying the cells. It's so amazing. You're talking about the proteins, and just it brought me back to the lecture. I was like, you would catch up with them amazingly. But what I was going to say through the end of the lecture is taking action for what we are going through at this moment instead of all the talking. You see a lot of talking, and you see a lot of talking about plastic, about um, food footprint, but you see people surrounded by plastic all the time. So what are we doing, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can we do, like you say, uh, very little, you know, to help, you know? That we can do is more recyclable, get rid of, you know, thank goodness they stop selling straw in the supermarket. And little things in our everyday life, you know? It's all about excesses. We don't need as much. We don't need a quarter of what we, you know, we are, we are just, to um, spoil, you know, with all the, and, and we are abusing it. That's, that's the thing that you say, the abuse of it, you know. So I think that's something to take home tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you. Maybe just a small question, or if, mm -hmm. if it would be a question or a comment for you too. Um, is there any balance between destruction and preservation, or actually? according to what you could research or there is um, or the destruction is already the balance for preservation if you see if you can see the well in the long run in the long run um, I think nature or according to the laws of God will balance itself I just watched a documentary called One Strange Rock 
is on Netflix mm -hmm. and it's very interesting. And if we look through the formation of Earth, there were many theories that all forms of life has been disrupted over the Earth. We don't have to go far, we see the dinosaurs were extinct, but you know, there was massive volcanic eruptions that destroyed most life. So we are in a process of constant transformation and the part of, the, the, the part of where human beings have been on this planet compared to the formation of the planet, it's so tiny, mm -hmm. it's so small. And yet we are making, we are making a, an, an effect, we are creating a consequence on the planet in this small period of time. There will be a result, I mean, there will be a consequence for that. So, the, the, what I take from it, like I mentioned before, God is the, the director. So, whatever needs to happen for this battle to happen, it will happen. Yeah. Sometimes we, we try to think, we try to find a balance, we try to calculate the balance, but in, in a way, we, it's, it's not, it's beyond our, our understanding or intelligence. But the planet will be fine. Self life will continue. Mm. Just how we adapt, how we transform to the changes, changes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, new needs will become, like with all the, the transformation. Uh, the planet will be fine, and new new things will appear, new needs will yeah, 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 yeah. and then everything will be carried on. Uh, one thing that I'd like to, to comment. Uh, the food chain came up like in our lives this few weeks ago, yeah, and we were discussing a lot about that. And one thing that came to me like uh, in our discussions is like how we uh, humans we are too much selfish. I think it's the a big big thing to think about because mm -hmm. I think it, it's one of the. Uh, when you uh, s stop and but why, why and uh, put lots of questions in it, we'll get that like humans, we are selfish mm -hmm. and yeah. like mm -hmm. that's a, a big thing to to reflect about when you uh, go for this the stop, for example, yeah. because when you stop and uh, look for ah, uh, okay, why people. Uh, don't use like the the space to grow animals and other food that go to the cows and stuff to grow vegetables for people. Uh, and then uh, when we evolved with this thinking, always like we we get to to this point. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting. And yeah. Um, part of the the research I did it was also the genesis. If you have the genesis. Home, have a look on chapter 3, chapter 3, item item 20 to 24. I'll, I'll pass it on to you later on WhatsApp. It explains very much about this specific topic, about you know the destruction of other beings to nourish ourselves. And it's, I thought it was really interesting to put, and you know, this was only there was only so much I could I could go into depth, but it's um yeah, I mean we all we all learning, you know, so much. You now there's so much knowledge out there, you know, that, that is, you know, a lot of it is new. You know, a lot of it is new research, new breakthrough in science. You know, that actually what we need and what, how much we need or how much we have, and you know, as far as, as uh, nutrition goes, you know, there's always uh, studies coming through. So it's, it's important to to question. It's important to question to find something that is suitable for your body, for your consciousness, for your conscious. And for your, for your life. Yeah. I think we're going over time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Maria. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Cool. So once again, oh, thank you, Facebook people, for being here with us. We're watching the video, and we see you next time.